Hello, welcome to everyone joining. Um, I will just give everyone a few minutes as we're only just over six o'clock to, to join. We've got a lot of you who are hoping to join today. So um, I will let a few more of you come in first. Thanks to everyone who's posting in the comment section where you're joining from. That's um, good to see as always on the Soccerpedia webinars where uh, whereabouts in the world you're, you're joining from. Um, nice, nice international contingency and obviously a lot of people from all over the UK as well. I've had, I can see one comment saying I can't hear you. Um, hopefully that's just a just a one off situation um, and everyone else can hear me okay. Great, Mark. Thank you for confirming. As uh, Lawrence has just posted, there's a there's a little button in the in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, which might help you with the audio if you're having any problems. But hopefully everything is all good, and we will get going. So welcome everybody to this evening's Q and A with. Robbie Burns, who I'm sure many of you know as the Naked Trader. Um, Robbie is, uh, well, as I'm sure a lot of you also know, is a prolific writer and he has written a couple of books, but there, most excitingly, is a new one coming out later this week, um, which I'm sure a lot of you will be looking forward to. So, Robbie, I'll give you a chance in a, in a minute just to, to um, introduce your book, introduce yourself as well. But uh, but first of all, um, just a little disclaimer, everything that Robbie and I say this evening um, shouldn't be taken as financial advice. Um, these are just hints and uh, and suggestions and ideas of uh, to help you, hopefully, with your investment process. Um, hoping Robbie's going to come back in a second. But, um, oh, yeah, here he is. He's fine. It's all good. Nobody panic. Um, in the book. So, Oh, perfect. That's that's ideal. I have actually got a picture of it in the next slide, but better to see the real thing. Um, I'm Megan Boxall. I'm the education editor at Stockopedia, and I will be fielding your questions. Um, don't worry. It's uh, you're, I know you're here for Robbie, so um, I won't uh, I won't be taking up too much more of your time. Um, but as I say, uh, Robbie has has written a new book uh, due out in a couple of days, available to pre pre order um, on Amazon and on I'm sure other platforms as well. Um, looks great the cover looks great um and the inside looks great i've actually had the privilege of uh, of seeing a, a pre-release copy on uh, on pdf which is uh, i've i've really enjoyed um so uh, just a little a little bit of housekeeping before we start um thank you to everyone who has pre-submitted questions we've got i mean almost 100 of them which is brilliant obviously we won't be able to get through every single question this evening but i've tried to group them in a way that We'll get through as many as possible. Um, if you've got any extra questions as we're going along, um, feel free to use the the chat box. I can see a lot of you who have already found it um, and are commenting in there. It's on the right hand side of your screen. So, um, so yeah, ask away, and I will put the questions to Robbie. We have Lawrence Judd as always um, moderating the uh, the chat call, chat box there, and also uh, Keelan Cooper has joined us today as well because there's so many of you needing an extra pair of hands. Um, so yes, thank you very much everyone for joining and we will kick off. So first of all, Robbie, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly and also introduce your new book? Yes, thank you very much. So Lawrence is moderating. Does that mean if anybody says, can you get that ball get off the screen? So Lawrence just deletes it before it goes on? Is that, is or, that what he or, does? Or, or closes you, or it depends how big they're on you. Yeah, if, That's if right. their argument is strong enough, then yes. maybe he'll just I'll, I'll, close the screen down. Yes, I'll try not to swear because, you know, I, I do tend to. So I'm going I'm to try and keep it clean, even though nobody probably minds. But bearing in mind we've got an international audience, there's one thing I really need to know from one or two of you is, who is that BBC guy? If you know, can you email me? Because I'm absolutely desperate to know. So if you're in Dubai or whatever, you probably know. Could you just, don't put it on the chat because it's obviously legal things. Just email me, robbythetrader at AOL.com. 
I'd be very happy. And one more thing, I was listening back to a podcast that I did, and I realize I say the word so a lot, and it's really annoying me. So if I say so more than 20 times during the next hour, I'm going to give 200 pounds to a charity of Stockopedia's choice. I don't know who's going to count the so's, Lawrence maybe, uh, if you'd like to start from now. So that's 20 so's, 200 quid to Stockopedia's charity. Because I just, I don't know why I keep saying so. It's really, I've just said it, that's one. Um, so yes, and um, yes, it's a new book. I, I wrote it because people said, well, you have your starter book, which is The Naked Trader, which is all very well, but it's more for beginners. And how about something a bit extra, some ideas? So there's about, I think there's about 50 ideas in here and it's not intended as, yeah, you're gonna use every idea. The idea is you, you might find four or five of them handy or useful. You might find someone that don't suit. For example, if you're not into shorting, then the shorting strategy isn't for you or you're not into this or that. Um, but I hope there's some ideas there built up over doing this for, would you believe it, nearly 25 years. Started in 1998, I think it was, when I started off on the, some of you might even remember, but I, did, I set up the Sky Teletext Finance Service. And uh, so I was on there and I started the blog in 19, yeah, it was 1998, I think. Um, complete crazy beginner. And I picked everything up on my own. Um, and so I quit my job three years later because I was making more money from trading than the job. And um, yeah, so I haven't looked back since then. Megan, I'm a bit of a chatterbox. So I was yes, just I interrupt me because once I start rambling, it's quite, and we've got 100 questions to get through. So don't hesitate to be Jeremy Paxman and cut me off. Okay, I was, well, I, uh, I will take you off on that. But yeah, um, yes, yeah, absolutely. R ramble away because everyone is here to, to listen to you. So, so, so don't worry too much about the okay. self moderation. I will, uh, I'll cut you off if I think you're going on Please. too long. Right. So, first question. Um, I know that your book isn't necessarily about uh, fully for, com for complete newbies. I know you've just briefly mentioned the uh, the start of your investing career, and you do mention at the start of your book that this isn't for people who are completely new to the investing game. Um, but also, you do you do write in a very uh, clear and coherent way, and I think it's certainly not an off-putting book for people who aren't maybe that experienced. Um, so, with that in mind, looking back to to 1998 when uh, you decided to start your investing career. This uh, this question from uh, from Jonathan came in, which I thought was a uh, was a lovely question. Was it plain sailing, and did you ever doubt your choice as an investor? Oh yes, it it wasn't plain sailing at all. The only thing was when I started, I started off with um, in those days they just started the ices. I think they were called pets in those days. So yeah. I started off with seven grand. That was all you could put in. And some of you probably remember those days. There was things like. The internet was just starting. So if a company said, we're going to launch an internet site, overnight their share price would double. So because of that, I got very lucky right at the start. So for my seven grand, it became 25 quite quickly in a year or two, just because the market was a bit wild at that time. And it was, some of you might remember the Daily Mirror scandal and people were tipping stuff in the papers and the share price would rise 100% overnight. This, this doesn't happen these days. So I got a bit of a lucky start, but I decided right from the start that I would never put more than whatever the ISA allowance is per year. And I've stuck by that. So over the years, every year, the only amount I've put in is the amount you're allowed to have as an ISA. It's 20 grand now, isn't it? I think it was 10 grand and then it went to 12, then it went to 16, sort of risen over the years. And the only other money I've put in is about 50K into spread betting accounts to mainly so I can go shorter stuff in a, in a sort of, in a bad time. Now I realised I'm rambling and I can't remember what the hell the question was in the first place. <laughs> Questions on the screen if you, uh, if you have a skit, but um, it was, did you have doubt? Um, that thing? It sounds like you've been very sensible over the years yes. with the amount you've put in. Um, I but did. yeah, yes. any doubt? I, I did, because in 2001, so I quit my job. It was quite well paid. I was getting paid about 120K. Uh, I was, you know, sitting there looking over, because I was working for Sky and it's, it's on the A4 and I was looking at a carpet right warehouse, which is quite handy because I ended up shorting carpet right because nobody ever went in to the carpet right warehouse as far as I could see. And I thought, well, oh, what have I done? Because I, I quit my job. And um, so by that stage, I think I had, I got it to about 60K, I think, in 2001. 
I thought, I can't believe it. I've dumped 120 grand and I've only got 60K. So, yes, I was, I thought I'm probably going to have to go back to work. Um, but no, um, I carried on. And then in, I think it was 2005 or six. I don't know why this happened, but the Sunday Times approached me and I started writing a column about my SIP because I was running uh, the SIP pension I got from Sky. I got, I think it was 33 grand from Sky and I started running that. So I did a weekly column for Sunday Times for about four or five years. And then Harriman House, the publisher, approached me to do the book. And all these things just came out of the blue. I hadn't really expected any of it. And um, so that's how it all started and how the book came up. And then in about 2008, I got an email from someone called Betty. I remember uh, I remember very well. She said, why don't, you, why don't you teach people what you do? And I thought, nobody's going to want to know what I, I'm not even sure I'm a very good teacher. So she said, give it, a, give it a go, maybe. So I thought, I don't really want to do seminars particularly. So I thought, why don't I put an outrageous price on it, like 500 quid? And would you believe it? In about a day, I got inquired from about 50 people wanting me to do one. I started my first event in, I think it was 2007 or 2008, just before the market started to crash. Um, I can't yeah, great. Again. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been a... Been a success, uh, certainly been a success. I mean, I, I think a lot of people um, like to hear about other people's success stories. One very brief question on this getting started thing. Obviously, you started a while ago. Yeah. We had a question from uh, Chris Ord, and he said he's 65, and is it too late for him to get into stocks and shares? No, of course it isn't. I mean, 65. You can live for another 30, 35 years. Um, yeah. Oh, definitely. I think, Chris, the main thing um, is just it just ensure you're happy you've got enough money to live off so that you're not using money you really can't afford to lose i always say can you afford to lose half of it so when i look at my portfolios and my spread bet accounts i think can i afford to lose half of it yeah no problem so i'm happy if you're not then then don't so let's say you think well i'll start off i could lose 20 grand i can stick 20 grand in an ice no, no problem really but I would say um, just start slowly. There's no need to rush things. And mm -hmm. so I don't know how much you've got, Chris, but um, assuming you have 20K, you can actually go in. Maybe, I mean, people often ask me, how many shares should I buy? And that answer is, well, what's, how much money do you have? So if you've got 20K, I would say something like, um, well, five shares, three to three and a half K each. Try and spread them out into sort of different areas of the market. My problem at the moment, I know this is a really fantastic problem to have is because I've got, I mean, in ISIS at the moment, I have my biggest ISIS has got about 1.5 million in. And I've got an ISIS with IG that's got about 150 in and one with II that's got another 150 in. Now, I find running the ones with smaller amounts of money much easier because I can I put I don't know, seven or eight grand in each share, but with a one and a half million, I know it sounds like a terrible problem to have. I've actually got 600 of that in cash because um, I don't want to have so much of a share that I can't get out of it. So so that, that's a tricky problem. So that the more you have, I think the harder it is to run. I'm sure some of you have got have built up quite a bit of money over the years. And I think some of you have found the same. There's a new thing which only just come out over the last year, which is called a flexible ISA, which means that you can actually take out a big lump sum, maybe stick it um, into a high interest paying account and you can put it back before the next tax year starts. I'm kind of thinking of doing that, trying to get four or five percent on that 600 and then put it back before the end of the tax year. Um, so but you, you must check that your ISA is a flexible one. I think Barclays is flexible. The IG is flexible. I think II is flexible as well, but obviously check. Um, but that's an yeah. interesting way, maybe if you built up too much cash and again i've rambled haven't i i've come off the no point. no not at all one actually very brief question that we did have which i wasn't going to ask but you've kind of touched on it anyway was which platform you use um and it is something i suppose it's interesting to people yeah. so um yeah is which, this, which is this is a stockbroker um yeah you? yeah yeah so barclays is my that's kind of the main funding only because mm -hmm. um it was this it was i put my ice money with that first mm -hmm. um and then i used uh interactive investor which i find pretty good uh, the IG one is uh, I like because 
you can do direct market access, which means I can try and buy shares at the sell price rather than the buy price. It's too complex to cover here. Um, yeah. But um, I think each platform has its strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, Interactive Investor, I think, pays 2 or 3% on cash balances. Barclays doesn't. IG, you can do DMA, but you can't do stop losses. But I think it's a good idea to spread your money out over the financial years with different brokers. And also, I think one of the reasons it's a good idea is that let's say you're in a very illiquid share. There's a profits warning in the morning. I'm going, oh, my God, how am I going to get out of this liquid share, which is had a profits warning? You can have your two laptops and you can have your Barclays and your I, I, IG. And you've got the same amount in each one and you can sell them both at the same time. Um, and then try and it's easier to get out of shares that have gone wrong with more than one account. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a uh, good advice. On that sort of nuance thing there, the one question which I which I thought was interesting, you obviously you're known in investment circles as the, the naked trader. But one of the questions was how do you differentiate between trading and investing? Um, that's a good question. Because I guess I do I think my fundamental thing is investing still. So yeah. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples, I think, thinking about this. So let's say I'm invested in, um, so probably, let me just look and see what my biggest, if I can just, I'm just going to log into Barclays and just check what my biggest positions is. So I've got, for example, some of you probably got it as well, a company called Me Group International, used to be Photo Me. And so I have, let me just see. Uh, so I've got about 100 grand's worth. I can just log in on that machine. Sorry about this. Uh, Barclays is, is notoriously hard to log into, which is one of its problems. But uh, well, I use IG, and it's sometimes worryingly easy to log into. So, <laughs> yes. uh, it <laughs> is for someone who yeah. like me always forgets their passwords. But I, uh, yeah, I yes, it remembers. Because Barclays in. tends to log you out with if you if you leave Barclays alone for more than a minute, you go, oh, which didn't log me out again? The bloody thing. Whereas IG, it, it, it's always on, which is yeah. But as you said, you know, we're talking about different accounts. That's uh, so, yeah, so I've just got my Barclays one up here. So currently I have, yeah, it's about one and a half million in it. And I've got 585,000 of that in cash at the minute. So I know my top holding is IQG Group. So I have 127 grand of that. Uh, looks like I bought 100K, so I'm up 27. That's quite a new buy. Um, I don't know how you pronounce it, IQGO. Big Geo, I, I've no idea, but um, went up again today. Uh, Me Group International is my uh, second biggest holding uh, with 100, 119,000 in that one. So for me, at the moment, those two companies are what I would call investments. So if I can, I'm going to hold on to them. Well, maybe forever if they keep on going up. Um, I mean, Me Group pays, I think, 4 or 5% dividend. I've actually held that since it was. 77p so with all my accounts so um, that's an investment i'm going to keep hold of it just got into the FTSE 250 however um if there was a question mark appeared like it said oh we are doing well with our laundry business but now we're not i'd then consider exiting so it has to keep up the good news uh, or else um i'm out a trade would be more like something for example for me would be spire healthcare which it's got a trading range of about £2.10 to about £2.35, £2.40. So my aim at the moment is I try and pick him up around two ten, and then I'm not too greedy, so I'm £2.30, would be fine. would more tend to do that in a spread bet account because probably a little bit cheaper and I don't have to pay stamp duty or commission. Um, and when, when it hits two thirty, I'll come out. So I consider that a range trade over maybe a month. What I'm not as a day trader, um, I'm not sitting there all day on my screen. Uh, by the way, all day traders lose. I'm sure that's quite well known. I think it's 95% lose day trading, 99% lose playing Forex. It's just a casino, really. So I'm, I'm not into that at all. Um, I mean, one share I've held since 2001, Telecom Plus, which is in a Bassett share certificate. I hope it's somewhere in the house. <laughs> it's worth about, uh, God knows what it's worth now. It must be worth about half a million. I'd have to pay tax if I started selling some. And over the years, I've had four or 500,000 in dividends from it. So yeah, it's good, actually, good stock. It's amazing, although because that's the only thing I have outside in ISO or spread bets. So eventually, when it comes to selling it down, I have to pay tax on the dividends on that. I have to declare that on my, my tax return, which is slightly sad. So I don't 
it's, it's very defensive, so I don't think about it a lot, but I have held that. I'm sure something about anything else I've held for a long time. I was looking down my list. So an extra part of this question, which came from Peter yeah. Wormsley, which is a very good question, was do you decide before each of your transactions whether it's a trade or an investment position? Pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. So I think one, so, oh no, that's two so's now. Flip. Um, I think it's slightly more than that. We've got quite a few counters in the chat box, but uh, you no, carry on. I'm <laughs> not going to give you 200 quid if I can help it. I've thrown myself off. off the, what are we talking about again? <laughs> Where do you decide pre or post buying if it's a trade or an investment? Right. Each trade become, uh, comes with a plan when I start it. So I think, what, what do I want from this share? So, ah! Oh, when I came across me group, I gradually... I start off with buying five grand of it, and as it goes up, I always average up. So I'm an average upper. I don't average down. I get out of a share. So I don't buy more of a share that's going down ever, except maybe once or twice when I made horrible mistakes. Me Group then gradually became an investment, so I'm guessing I've held that for well over a year, maybe a year and a half from when I originally bought it. Whereas... Uh, Spire was always a range trade. The only thing is, if I was in Spire, and let's say there was a fantastic statement, I could change my mind and let that become a long-term trade. Let's say they put out a great statement. I go, oh, hang on a minute. And it, and it climbs through the range. It goes up further. I, I, I then might consider holding on to it. So, so I'm going to have to pay you 200 quid, aren't I? Um, I would, I would hold on to it. I mean, I might hold on to me group for another two years. I mean, if it goes to 220, 230 over, I'm happy to be patient with it. Great. OK, well, let, let's move on to that sort of investment process, because there were a load of questions that came uh, that came in about various different parts of the investment process, um, which is great. And I think everyone would like to hear about that. So I guess like starting at the first point is that ideas generation stuff. Um, I mean, a few questions around the same thing, but one of them, which I think captures it quite nicely, is this one. So with, with such a large universe of stocks on the London Stock Exchange, how do you initially identify ideas? Of course, we have a lovely Stockopedia. Which <laughs> is fun. My view on finding shares is not liked by many because us humans are a pack animal. We tend to like to follow what other people are doing, whereas I don't. And this is where the Stockopedia algorithms I absolutely love. The reason I really like them is, I'm trying not to say that word as well, which is why I'm going a bit slower, is it takes the emotion out of it. The algorithms are just algorithms. They're not human. They're not emotional. And I love particularly the quality score at the top. Not so interested in the value score to be honest because i'd rather try and find the value myself or necessarily momentum it's the quality score at the top that i find is is always excellent and if that's under 60 i'm going there's got to be something wrong with this share and i use then the stockopedia screens what i don't do and what i find a lot of people do and this i get more and more surprised i've literally just done a retreat we've done two retreats with investors in Spain, just come away from one in, in June. We did one a couple of weeks ago. And um, two or three of them were holding things like Boohoo. They bought them at three quid and four quid. Saga, I think, was another one. I And they were holding it. The losses were huge. And I said, well, why did you buy it? And but why didn't you sell it? And they said, well, everybody was buying it on the Stockopedia discussion forum. I was going, well, that's not a real, that's fine, but where was your plan to exit the, the share when it starts to go down? And I avoid finding shares from magazines and bulletin boards and discussion forums because you're then emotionally involved with the person that brought it to your attention. And generally, the people often say, oh, I'm going to buy some more. And you say, oh, yes, other people, other people saying, don't worry, stay with it. And that kept me in it. But then I said, you're just holding it. It's 50p. You bought it at four quid. That's crazy, a crazy thing to have. And what I realise often is it's very hard to change somebody's behaviour once you've got a pattern going with your trading. 
let's say you like a share in particular, I think it's very hard to sell it and crystallize a loss. That's particularly with men. Women, however, I find are really good at cutting uh, their losses. And when I do these seminars, I find it's the women that tend to come back for repeats more than men and who do well because they're really, really good at cutting, um, cutting their losses. Mm, but actually back, to the question, yeah, back to the question though, um, the, the, the Stockopedia screens I like the most at the moment, I really like the quality momentum one. I'm just gonna bring that up now, where are we? So that's under, I think it says top QM, doesn't it? 142 stocks on that one. Because you're getting quality and the momentum part of it picks up shares that are going up. And I see I hold a few shares on that. I can see Oxford Instruments at the top there. So I've got that. Money Supermarkets on there. And I have some of that. Um, so with those screens that you are that yeah. you're looking at, is it so sort of moving on to this next question here? Do you have? It sounds like the answer to this is no. But do you have that set number that you check? Those ones that you're regularly going back to, or are you just sort of picking and choosing various screens as as where, where the market takes you, where what what you're feeling on the day. What what is it that makes you go and look at those screens? Actually, to be really honest now, because I'm pretty happy with my portfolio, it tends to be when I do the online seminars, because I spend the whole literally we spend the whole day looking at new shares. So I'm doing one on Friday, for example. So Friday. I haven't actually looked at screens for three or four weeks. I knew this Friday I was going to be doing this all day. Um, and that's when I kind of do my research live with people. Um, and that's the time that I'll be looking. But if, let's say, for, I mean, I think we had a question. Somebody said something like, well, I've only got I don't know, half an hour spare every day. How am I going to do my research? It's fine. You can do it at the weekend. And bits and pieces of a bit of luck. It's a bit like it's, you're finding the proverbial golden nugget out of all the, the crap. But what Stockopedia screens will help you is to avoid the crap by looking at the, because an algorithm pretty much tells you something's crap. For example, you've got the brilliant word sucker, which is hard to say, sucker stock, say it quickly, it's a bit of a tongue, tw tongue twister. And that immediately tells you this share is probably one to be avoided. And what the Stockopedia screens, I think, are great at finding shares, but you can also eliminate them fairly quickly when the algorithm pretty much tells you. Mm -hmm. But I do like, if you're new, I would say explore anything with quality, because if in the end you buy a good quality company, at least you have a chance. But what I find is, not only with beginners, but sometimes more experienced people, I think in our minds is, I want to make a million out of this stock tomorrow. So you I find people get excited if you say something like plug oil or dum dum commodity or I don't know, um, one disco, something with a fun name or it looks exciting, it looks a gamble. I don't know why people tend to go for those, even if it says sucker stock or the, or the quality says 40. I don't know what it is. Do people, I think some people think, oh, that's a bit boring. But over the years, it's the boring ones always surprise. To the upside. I mean, we had sure serve recently, which is probably one of those boring stocks around. And suddenly, somebody else saw the value and it goes up forty percent overnight on a bid. And you often find if you're buying quality companies, that's where you get the bid. And, and, and suddenly, out of nowhere, you're up thirty, forty percent, which is uh, fantastic. Yeah, great. So uh, we have also actually had quite a few questions about uh, about international markets. Um, uh, so, so <laughs> expanding the investment universe even further. I, I'm very pro investment investing in international markets, especially if you are that looking for quality. There are so many high quality companies in the US and in Europe. Um, and as I use IG, as I said, as my investment platform, the fees for buying and selling are actually quite competitive um, yeah. for the international stock, especially in the US. Um, so, um, what what is your attitude to trading in, in international markets? Do you do it, or is it is it somewhere something that's a uh, beyond your sphere of uh, interest i'm going to disappoint you here megan because <laughs> not really uh, one of my reasons is um i want to be done at 4 30 and obviously the american market then we've got till nine o'clock i don't really want to be sitting there in the evening with my laptop looking at more shares and in fact when i have uh, if i have done us shares i actually shorted them uh, during the virus um things like Robinhood Markets, uh, Uber, several of the shares. 
I actually think the American market is madly overvalued. And yeah, I think at some point, an argument to be made there. I think it's going to come. I think the UK market looks cheap. But if you look at any American stock and you use your um, stock to P ratio, you're looking at 50, 60, 70 times. Any slight disappointment and or if you're in Tesla and Elon Musk goes crazy on Twitter and says something mad, you're going to be down 20%. Yeah. So, so my reasoning is I like to find something I can put a value on. And what I always do is I always pretend that I am presenting this share to Peter Jones or Deborah Meaden from Dragon's Den. And am I going to get a smile from Peter Jones or am I going to get a sneer? Is Deborah Meaden going to go like that? Are they going to go, oh, yeah. So that's when I find that gives me the final edge. Should I buy this share or not? And looking at some of the American shares, if I presented them to Peter Jones, he just told me to get out of the room. And I think there's going to be a reckoning in the States, and who knows when, but it looks, it looks like a, to me, it looks like a Jenga board, and there's a couple of bricks left at the top. And at some point, that last piece will go in, and the whole thing will, don't want to, don't want to worry you, Megan. Anyway, it's only my view. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, for it's me, it's the... Uh... I definitely agree with you with the uh, with the crazy valuations in some stocks. And yeah, as you say, look, for a company like like Tesla, and there are other ones out there as well, where you've got someone who is charismatic but also potentially a little bit uh, a little bit wild uh, yeah. leading the show. It's um, potentially slightly too high a risk, especially when there's such a high yeah. valuation. It's also hard with um, the American stocks. It's hard to know where you, where you'd even put stop loss in. Because it can yeah. suddenly just it, suddenly it'll be down fourteen percent, then it might go up. It, it's just ah, uh, it's just so crazy that I I am happy with my niche and not chasing stuff. However, what I've done is, for example, I was quite interested in having a bit of exposure to artificial intelligence. So rather than think I'm going to lob loads of money into Nvidia and take a risk, I bought the RBOT uh, exchange traded fund instead. So that's got like two and a half percent in Nvidia. And it's, got, it's, it's invested in 2030 AI companies or AI robotic companies. It's doing quite well, actually. So it's, I think the code is ROBT. And you can, if you can Google that, you'll see all the different companies they're invested in. And that's a kind of safer way for me to maybe invest in America and American robotic companies. And that yeah, might be, yeah. I certainly Sorry. think that sounds like a good uh, um, a good process, and especially in sectors that maybe you're not so familiar with. And actually, we have got a specific question about um, about the uh, about where you sort of where you're familiar and things like that. Well, I think I've got that coming up slightly later. But for now, just sticking with the sort of process stuff. So, identify your ideas. Screens, as you say, excellent way to identify um, those initial ideas. Um, and I think coming back to that question, um, you you mentioned earlier. Um, it was uh, Richard Leppington, and he actually said he had two hours a day to spend researching. To me, that sounds like quite a lot, and I can yes, agree with you. You definitely, um, no, <laughs> definitely no. can do it on uh, on far little, uh, far less time really? than that. Yeah. So, um, how long do you spend from that initial, like, oh, I might buy this, to, okay, I'm going to make the transaction now? What's the sort of time period for you actually spending? Well, doing this, is, I mean, this is interesting because sometimes, so let's say I'm doing this. Uh, I'm doing this um, live event on Friday. What will happen is we will probably go through some of the stock appeal screens and we'll go, no, sucker stock, this looks terrible. And then we'll suddenly go, oh, hang on, this, this looks interesting. And then we will look at the chart of it and look at the fundamentals. We'll look at the website of the company as well. I, I find the whole thing interesting. It's a bit like detective work, I suppose. And then it's a decision. Then you say, well, she said a good day to buy it or not. And I think it then becomes uh, um, being a bit streetwise, I would say, as to, as to whether it's a buy or not. And that's when I would be looking at things like level two in the order book. And what I want to see is there's loads of buyers under the current price or the price is well supported on the order book. And that would give me the final yes or no. The other thing is, is a statement about to come out because what's happening is you could be in a fantastic company but what happens is the statement's due in three days the statement's fantastic the share price hammers down and everyone's going oh, that's not fair this is a great company share price is going down well it's because the share price went up a lot and people are going ah oh, well 
okay, the news is good, but we knew it was good, and it's going down. So I would, oh, I just said it again. Um, if you, if a share is coming up to announcement day, it might be better and safer to wait until the announcement itself, potentially, mm -hmm. to avoid maybe getting stuck into even a good one that, that goes down on the day. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, cool. Uh, you just mentioned there the, the level two data. We did actually have quite a lot of questions come in, which came in beforehand about level two data and whether it's something that's worth paying for. Obviously, it's something that, that you use. Um, I, I don't. Um, is it something that you uh, you suggest that investors use? This, this came up for me, and funny, it wasn't when I first started in 98. In those days, long time ago, you'd pick up the phone to the broker and you'd say, yeah, can you buy me a, a certain amount of that? And I'd say to the broker, can you buy me... 5,000 shares and this she said oh I've just looked at level two and I think Mr Burns you might want to wait because there's lots of sellers and I was intrigued I thought what the hell is this and I found out because I was head of finance at Sky I actually had a Reuters machine on my desk with level two I didn't even know it was there and I started using it and over four or five years of using it I got I found I got really streetwise with it and personally now I wouldn't buy or sell anything unless I saw that first. And there's a, uh, I can't really do it here because it's too complex, but you can also test out how many shares market makers have in a share. Um, one tip maybe I'll give you, uh, which wouldn't cost you anything, is, 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 is if you find it very easy to buy shares, so you can buy you can buy tons of a, of a small cap share, for example, really easily. It's not good news. It means the market makers are willing to sell them to you usually that means they're probably about to go down. But if the share's a bit scarce, let's say you go to your Barclays or your IG and you go, oh, I'm going to buy 5,000 shares in this. And you know it sometimes goes, oh, I don't have the 15-second countdown. Or it says, we can't do your order. That's a great sign. It means the market makers don't want to sell you shares. Put a limit order in slightly higher or get on the phone. And then I would buy them then. But let's say it's Friday. Let's say it's this Friday. I'm just looking at a share at random. I can see... I don't know, um, Games Workshop is on this um, quality list. And we go, yeah, Games Workshop looks great today. Yeah, the chart looks good. Everything looks good. Yeah, we like this. Why don't we, why don't we buy it? And I go to level two and I see, oh, hang on a minute. There's somebody who wants to sell 50 grand's worth on the right-hand side. Or we do the market maker test and we go, oh, hang on a minute. Market makers are happy to, happy to sell you £150,000 worth of this. I'd go, no, this, I, would put, I would put it on my shortlist, but I wouldn't buy it there and then. Same also applies to taking profits on something. Um, if I see lots of buyers still in the background, I'll stay with it. And, and that's how mm -hmm. I learn. I, I see it a little bit like you've got your share, you've found your great quality share. But after that, the decision when to buy and sell, it becomes a little bit like a game of Texas Hold'em. So you, we've got five cards the market makers or the market's got five cards. To me, level two lets you see a couple of cards. Just gives you a little bit of an edge. That's how I feel about it. However, okay. if you're a beginner, well, you'll probably be all right without it for a while, but it's something once you get more experienced to look at and understand how a share price is made up and the fact that when you buy a share, it doesn't just go on the internet somewhere. Somebody's willing to sell you the shares. There's a counterparty. Why is that counterparty wanting to sell you those shares? Yeah, no, that's really, that's really interesting. And that, that tip is really handy, especially you say either if you're not willing to or not able to buy that extra data or if you're not really sure how to use it. That's a handy tip to uh, for, for, for those investors. It also sort of segues quite nicely into, oh, we've done this question. I'll, uh, I'll skip that one. But it segues on quite nicely to, um, we had loads of questions about when to sell. It's a question we get asked at Stockopedia all the time. It's so difficult to answer. It's the hardest because thing. Yeah, yeah. It uh, really... because obviously it's different all, yeah. all the time. Um, but yeah, this question, I think, sums it up really nicely. Um, it's a kind of a two parter. Um, how do you know when to take profits and sell a stock that has performed well? So that's the, the first part on the positive. And then how do you know when to cut your losses and sell a stock that has decreased? Um, yeah, that's a brilliant question, because it's what everybody. Sorry if I'm, I burp here, but I've just had six scallops and some mushy peas. <clears throat> to be honest, I'm feeling slightly windy. Oh, that's better. Um, okay, well, the first part of the question is how do you know when to take profits and sell a stock that has performed well? That's one of the hardest things because 
because your stocks perform well, we were talking about confirmation bias earlier, and you're thinking, oh, I don't really want to part with this stock because it's doing so well. What I do every time is I, th oh, oh, I'll give you an example. Actually, this is an example today. Um, Me Group International reported today. It's gone up. I've had it since 70p. I've made a fortune on it. But I'm holding, on whatever it is, 120 grand's worth. Should I take some profits today? This is what I do. I have a mindset where I go, never seen Me Group International before. I'm coming with it from scratch. I'm going to research the whole thing from scratch. I did this this morning. Researched the whole thing, and I looked at it and I thought, yeah, that, that Ford P is only 12 still. Still got 25 million in cash. It's all pretty positive. It's joined the Ford GT50. There's probably more upside here. And if I was going to go from scratch, if I was seeing this share from scratch, I would probably buy it. In which case, I'd probably buy some more rather than sell it. If I find, um, it's a halfway house and I'm looking at it. What do I buy for this from scratch? Oh, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe not. Then I would sell some of it. So I would probably top slice, maybe sell 20 or 30%. However, I'll give you an, I can give quite an example of this in a minute. If I go into it and I go, oh, hang on a minute. P is 17, 18 now, it was sort of 11 when I bought it. And would I buy it now? No, sell the whole lot. So that's how I look at it. So. If I buy it again, I'll buy more. If I'm not sure, I'll sell some. If I wouldn't buy it from scratch again, I would probably dump the lot. And I think a good example comes to mind of a recent one that I did take profits on, which is a company called Victorian Plumbing. And I had a bit of luck here. It was literally, I was lying lazily in bed at half seven looking at the news coming in on Investigate, uh, which is a free news platform. And I hadn't come across Victorian Plumbing before, and I. I went, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like it said it had net cash of 40 million. And orders were very strong. It was a very confident outlook. I thought, oh, this looks really good. I thought, market cap. And I can't remember, these aren't exact figures. The market cap was 15 million. And I thought, hang on, it's got net cash now of 40. It's doing what? I'm really going to buy some of these. And it was about eight o'clock. And I thought, God, these shares are going to be marked up 30%. So I probably won't. I thought, what? They've not been marked up at all. So I went and Ended up buying, oh my God, I can't remember, probably ended up with about 50 grand's worth in a couple of days. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I got them at about 40p. They went in the end to about 90p after another good report. And that's when I looked at it from scratch. And when I looked at it from scratch, I think the Ford P ratio had gone to 18. I thought, well, 18 for builders, merchant, that's starting to look a bit high. Don't think I would buy them now. So I sold, I kept a very small amount, but I sold nearly all of them. Um, not right that high, I think I sold them at 85, 88, 90p, something like that, in two or three tranches. So that's an example with today, I held on to me group, Victorian Plumbing, I sold them because I wouldn't have bought them again. Mm, yeah, good, good rules. Um, and it, obviously good to have rules as well. Um, take that emotion out of it. So an even harder part of the emotional journey, certainly I find is, the, that second part of the question, how do you know when to cut your losses? I think in a way that's a little bit easier because you should have that plan in place. So for example, would be when I bought that Victorian plumbing, let's say it was 40p, I would have probably had a stop at something like 36, 35p, so that um, if it started to decrease then I would come out. I find it very easy to flog stocks that have done badly for me. And the trouble is, I think most people is they will cling on. And the more I meet, I mean, I've met thousands of investors over the years. It's so hard to sell a share that's losing. I think it's the hardest thing anyone can do. But if you can get in practice of doing it, you then only need two or three or four big winners you can take loads of small losses and it doesn't matter because you're riding the wave up. And I know it sounds really boring. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, run your profits, uh, take your losses. It's much easier said than done. So, oh, no, there must be about 15 of those now. I suggest if you can, every share you come across, plan it. Now, where you put your stop loss is a very hard thing to do because every share is different. And, for example, if it's a small cap, you might have a massive spread of four or five points. 
And the other thing people forget is ex-dividend days, so which is usually every Thursday. Some shares can pay 30, 40p dividend. On an ex-dividend day, the shares are going to drop by 40p. If your stop loss is inside that 40p range, you're going to get stopped out at 8 o'clock. I have that in The Naked Trader, actually. It's called 8 a.m. stopouts, because at the start of the day, that's the widest part of the spread for any share, because the market makers have just woken up. Nobody's really put their orders in yet. And you get these massive spreads on shares, and that's when you could get stopped out. So what I suggest you do is have a look back over the history of the share. How, how far does the, um, does, the, does the spread go out at 8 o'clock? when it opens up in the morning. It's very important to check that and put your stop well below that or you, you will get stopped out. Because there's, there's nothing worse than you have a stop, it goes down, your stop gets hit and then it goes back up again. I, that's yeah. obviously happens to all of us and it's really frustrating. The other place I would put it out is look at the chart of the share you're buying. Where does it find support? So let's say you're buying a share at 50 pence and you see, well, when it dips, it dips to 45p, but then it, find support at 45p and that's a pretty good support area and stick your stop loss a couple of points under that because you are taking out the spread and when you've got your stop in you're now under control of that trade so the people I talked about earlier that have bought boo at whatever it was four quid and are now holding it at 50p that should never ever happen even if that had a 50p stop loss they'd have been out at 350 or three um, and they'd be gone and even if sometimes your stop gets hit and it goes back up, well, okay, you can always buy it back. But you've you've got discipline. And I think the hardest thing to do, what I notice with people is once a, uh, a share you have is minus 20% or below, you now say, ah, it's not worth selling it now. I might as well hold on to it. Even if it's minus, so, ah, oh, no. So again, a couple of people that came to the last retreat, they were holding these these shares that were so far down. And I say, cut it even now, even if you're down 80%, because you're going into this, you're going to put your portfolio every day, and there's this flipping bloody share that's down 70%. It's going to make you keep watching it all day long because you desperately want this share to go up and up, and you're getting emotionally involved with it. And there's various shares in the market people get involved with. You're running a business, do not get emotionally involved and have the ability to cut it sometimes i don't even wait for the stop loss to get hit one so let's say i'm definitely gonna have to send you 200 quid on so if a share has gone down i bought it on a thursday it's monday and I'm, ah it's going down i'm looking at this again the market doesn't like this for some reason i'm looking at level two and i'm going oh there's loads of sellers on this i'm going to change my mind i'm just going to get out so i use a get out quick mm -hmm. because the market if your share price is going down a little bit in drips and drabs every day, there's probably a reason. And the first cut is the deepest. I think that's a song, isn't it? I'm sure. I think I think it is. Yeah. Um, an interesting follow up on this um, and the Q and A right now, which I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to because it's a good point in in the current market. Um, what do you do with your stop losses in a bear market when everything's going down? Well, we've had a. I think we've had today has been very good. The last, what, three or four weeks has been um, pretty bad. Uh, I think when we're into a bit of a bear market, why not cut substantially some of your holdings? For example, as I think I said in that main ice storm, I'm sitting on 600k cash in that now because... It's a summer market, it looks a bit, I know it's been a good day today, but on the whole, the market's in a little bit of a sorry state. And rather than let stop losses get hit, I'm more likely to come out. One thing I would say is, you don't have to sell the whole of your stake in something. If you're not sure, sell some of it. You don't have to get rid of it all and stick it in cash. One thing which surprises me, going off on a little bit of a tangent, and I didn't know this on any of the questions that, that you sent me was the inability, well, not the ability, but if you consider that we are doing this to make money, so we're running, I feel myself, this is my business, this is what I do for a living, and so I'm like a fund manager running my own fund, is we have an ability as uh, small investors to easily go short on crappy shares 
or go short of the market. And I'm sometimes very surprised at the fact that nearly everybody is long only. If you go to any of these uh, the spread betting companies and you see some of them say, well, our clients are 80, it's always our clients are 90% long or 100% long of this share. It's very rare when you go, or oh, our clients are always 80% or 100% short. Because I think you feel like you're an investor. I don't feel that. I feel like I'm a businessman and I want to take advantage of the markets going down. So I think it's important to look at being able to do that because it isn't complicated. And I would say uh, over the last three years, I've made a lot more money from shorts than I have from longs. My biggest one being I made roughly, I can't remember what it was, probably 50K on shorting Aston Martin from 18 quid down to two quid. Sucker stock on Stockopedia. That, that's how I picked that one up, actually. I don't know if it's still a sucker stock because the Saudis keep putting money into it, but it had a, I don't know, it was worth 1.7 billion, but it didn't make any money. And it was, it had a debt of about a billion. So to me, it was a, it was a straightforward short. The AA, I picked up a whole load of on the AA and boohoo from four quid down to 50p. That was another great short as well. I think I'm just mentioning this on the side that it amazes me that I did, I don't know. I haven't seen all the questions, but the questions I've seen, no one's mentioned shorting at all. Some people see it as a, it's a bad thing. I don't know, maybe morally bad, but I'm not sure about that. Um, I know I've gone off topic here, but I just. No, no, I think uh, we did have a few questions about shorting. I think oh, did we? Oh, okay. I didn't realise yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, there were a few. And it is, it is interesting. Obviously, for some people, I think, as you say, some people think it's morally bad. I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that either. I think it's quite healthy to have shorters in the market. Um, but I think for other people, there is that sort of fear factor, slight, slightly more complex. Um, but yeah, something that if you're if you're comfortable and confident um, that, yeah, can definitely be uh, definitely be a nice um, addition to, to managing a portfolio. Um, obviously, you mentioned quite a few winners there and things that you've done right. One of these questions that I uh, I liked and uh, felt a bit nosy about, so I thought I would ask it. Uh, what is your biggest ever loss and what did you learn from it? Oh, I learned loads. Uh, probably this would be early 2000s. There was a, a coffee. I don't know if you remember. You're probably too young to remember it called Coffee Republic, which was a branch of coffee, coffee shops. Uh, a bit like Starbucks, I don't actually know why they did so badly but I bought them I think they were 28p and then I did the usual sucker investor thing of buying more at 23p and I bought more at 16p and then I was really emotionally involved I was going to my local coffee republic and buying a double shot to try and get the share price up <laughs> which was crazy because I also um ran a cafe myself a little bit I, I kept going up and going can you put those muffins on the top shelf because the margin is so good on muffins and I realized that whenever I was visiting the store, the staff would duck under the counter because they didn't want to deal with me. Because they were thinking, oh my God, it's that bald nutter who's coming around telling us where to put our muffins. I thought, this is ridiculous. I can't even sleep at night because I'm, I'm drinking so much caffeine. This is mad. So I cut it at 8p. I think I lost about nine or 10 grand. And I never went, I never went. but I realized, don't average that, don't buy this. Don't keep buying a crap share as it goes down. It's the worst thing. That was one biggest lesson I learned from that. More recently, I lost a few quid on something called Ince, which I think was a legal firm. I think I bought some at, I can't really remember. I think it was 60p and then they hit a stop at 55, which is fine. I thought this still has good value. I'm going to give it another try. So I think I bought, so I cut it. I didn't average down. I bought some more at 52p, something like that. Again, it hit a stop 10% lower. And then it hit my three times rule. So I've got a rule. If I buy a stock three times and I've lost money each time, it comes off my screen and I don't look at it for six months. Otherwise you get emotionally involved and you have this human thing is, I want to get my money back off this stock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a very strong emotion. And what mm. I found over the years is people get obsessed with one or two shares and it keeps, and they can't understand. I think those, I briefly looked at one of your, forums and somebody said something like i've got sylvania platinum it looks brilliant i don't understand somebody tell me why it keeps on going down i think somebody says well it's because the price of rhodium is going down or whatever it, whatever it is and um people then get obsessed and, and they i know because i met them and they literally keep looking at the same stock all day long hoping it's going to go up and then they 
I'm just going to buy some more because I want to lift the share price up, a bit like I did with Coffee Republic. And this is very unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And the best thing you can do is sell these things. And it's so hard. I find it easy now and I like it. I'm going, yeah, let's get rid of it. I don't mind at all. Yeah, I guess it's that switching that mindset, isn't it? To, it's, yeah, just uh, it's, move, move on from it. That uh, sounds like a very, very good thing. But... Sometimes, by the way, you and the reason why we, we always say don't put more money in than you can afford is sometimes something comes out of the blue and you don't realise. I had one called I Energizer, which the, fact that the stats were fantastic on it and it paid – I've got loads of dividends from it. I've got one dividend of 16 grand at one stage a couple of years ago. And I thought, yeah, it's a long-term hold, no problem. Uh, lucky for me, I did get out of some of them before uh, an instant because it kept on going down. I think it hit a couple of stops. But I still held quite a few. Now, out of the blue, the guy that owned it, and I didn't stupidly didn't do enough research, owned 80% of it and said, tough luck, suckers, I'm taking it private and I don't care about any of you. Don't know how he sleeps at night. Within a few hours, the share had gone down by three quarters. I don't know how much I lost. I think at least five or six grand, I think it was. But that was out of the blue. So sometimes there's, there's things that come out of the blue, which is why I always say be careful about how much you put in. And particular where people go wrong, I do feel, is they put too much in small caps. And they don't realise how hard it is to sell a small cap when there's a profits warning. Just try and get out of it. Because I learned my lesson in 2008. The market makers will switch off their quotes and good luck to you. And a lot, a lot of people don't realise, let's say it's a small cap, maybe the market cap is 30 million or something and it's a pound and there's a profits warning and it opens up at 60p. The market makers, once you're outside the exchange market size, they can say, well, I'll offer you 5p less if you want to get rid of them. And you'll find that it's very, very, they're very hard and you get stuck with these terrible small cap shares that you actually can't get rid of. Mm. I say be very careful with anything with a market cap of under 50 million. I very rarely trade in those. If I do, it would be for very small amounts. I'm more happier with probably FTSE 250 shares where they're very liquid. Because I'm dealing with big sums as well, which I know I'm very lucky to be able to do, I would. So I don't mind building 80, 100 grand in a FTSE 250 shares. I certainly wouldn't in a, in a small, small cap. Because you can get wiped out way too easily and I found some of the people that I've met on the retreats or at seminars literally bought too much of a small cap and they're exposing themselves to more risk than they realise. There was one chap who I think had bought 150 grand worth of something, I think it was called Revolution Bars, I don't know, a pub chain and he bought them at 150p and they went down to 50p or 40p and I think that's when he sold me, you know, he lost 70 or 80 grand. I said, you were crazy to hold so many. Why don't you just buy five grand or 10 grand? And I think the reason is that you think, I'm going to make my million out of this. If it goes to, oh, yes, I mean, I've got one good example. I remember really clearly a guy that came to a hotel seminar, this was 2018. He was sitting on the back row, and he literally, his portfolio, to be frank, was full of shit. And his girlfriend was sitting next to him, eyes rolling. I know he just buys rubbish shares. And... Uh, he was just totally convinced that these shares were going to carry on going up and there's nothing I or any one of us could do to get him to sell them. And I said, why? And he said, well, the thing is, I had bought, I think it was he bought 150 grand's worth of a share at 12p. And in his mind, all these shares have to do is get to 50p and yes, I'm going to be a millionaire. I was thinking, yeah, but what, if they, what if they start going down? No, no, they're going to 50p. I read it on a bulletin board. Nothing I could do. The shares eventually went to one piece. I'm guessing he lost all his money. But I would suggest everyone does the opposite. So when you come across a share, think, don't think I'm going to make millions in this share. Think what's the worst that could happen first? What could make this share go down 50% overnight? Check for the downside first. Pretend you're shorter of the share. So before you buy any share, think, could a shorter make mincemeat of this share and go, yeah, but come on, look at the look at the debt on that or something like that. Always look for the downside, don't because as investors, we're looking at the upside. Think, what could I lose? How much could I lose on this one if I've got it horribly wrong? And that's a very hard mindset to come across. But literally, that's my first port call is 
what am I what am I missing? So I have a little um, highlighter system, which so I look at the last full year or half year report and it picks out negative words in red. And I go down a report and the, the red words are often near the bottom of the screen because companies are very clever. And the other thing to look out for is if they put EBITDA at the top. When you look at the, the, the profit, it says EBITDA, rather than saying profit for tax, the headline is EBITDA figure. Because EBITDA is basically BS uh, profits. Find out where the profits before taxes and use that figure. Don't use something called EBITDA or whatever it is. It's, yeah, yeah. It's heavily adjusted. Um... It's always a sign that if a company's putting out the top, it's yeah, yeah. No. This is being a bit streetwise, and also another thing: if they often, if they've got big net debt, try and find it. It's always near the bottom of the report, so I pick that out in blue on my highlighter system. Um, and uh, you're often, find, for example, the AA used to put out this great report saying, "Oh, our profits have gone up from 300 million to 350," and then you go down and down and down, and then net debt 2.7 billion. Are you nuts? That's when I shorted it. I thought, this is completely mad. This AA isn't worth anything. You make a million and no 2.7 billion it isn't worth very much. Well, we have rapidly hit the hour mark, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's flown by, and you've given us loads of fantastic, I'm happy, I'm happy things. I'm happy to stay on for long. I'm happy to stay on for longer, no problem. Um, I just want to, just to 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 wrap it up, um, we ha did have, um, Oh, we've we've kind of addressed this one. Um, we did. We have had a few questions, a lot of questions about the current state of the market. What is your current attitude to to what's going on? Where I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know where it's going. But but how are you currently approaching your investment? Is it different to how you've been like your normal process? Um, where are you looking for ideas? Well, Alan Sugar, who we all know and kind of love. I'm not sure he's always got this thing where he says. You haven't got a bloody clue, not a bloody clue. Frankly, Megan, I've got not a bloody clue as to where anything is going. My view is to follow the market gradually because markets are bonkers. They are mad, but they do tend to look forward. It doesn't really matter what happened three months ago. It's what's going to happen in six months to a year that matters most. And I literally follow it. An example would be over the last six weeks, it's gradually been grinding down and down. So I've gone into some cash. I've got some ETF shorts open in my ISA to take advantage of the downside. But if gradually things start to go up again, I don't know whether today was a what they call a dead cat bounce. I'm not sure yet. But I'll gradually go with it. I don't panic or worry too much. And then go with it. And sometimes you'll find if you go with the trend, it can make you an awful lot. In other words, during the virus, when that hit, I just literally kept opening up footsie short. I don't do that normally. It was this early 2020, I think it was, wasn't it? And I just kept on and on. And I bagged about uh, 220 grand, I think, from that probably once in a five year bit of luck because it literally just kept on going down. So it was quite easy. And that's where we haven't had the time to talk about spread betting, which is a shame, but I would suggest you look into it to be able to, if we are in the downturn for the next four or five months, it could be the only way to make money. There's lots of spread bet firms around. I would suggest if you want to learn about it, then I have a book called, uh, I think it's called, Make a trader guide to spread betting. You want edition two. And I go through loads and loads of work examples, especially of shorts, on how to do it. I would suggest for a beginner, spread X is the easiest. They're quite old school. You'll be able to get hold of them quickly. And if something goes wrong, they'll they'll take you out. They're kind of not sitting around trying to take your money. So I think probably something like spread X would be a good one to kick off with. Um, and have that ability to go short if you can in a in a down market. I beg and I wish I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> but I don't know. And I don't, I think you have to be careful because you maybe, I don't bother with Bloomberg and all the rest of it, but you often see the American are uh, well, the worst, aren't they? They have these blokes going, yeah, we're in for a big bear market. Or, you know, we're in for a big bull market. They all, they all seem to be very convincing, don't they? Like they know what they're talking about. But let's no, face absolutely. it, they're paid to BS. Mm. And that's what it is because no one knows. 
Maybe another virus will come out of the blue. But the good news, I think, is the markets aren't as quick to react as you think. An example of that would be uh, when the, the virus, the original virus struck, the FTSE was actually at 7.7. And even though Boris Johnson was saying, <laughs> you, know, you know how it's true, <laughs> out of all your hands or whatever, it was still at 7.2 and it ends up at 5. And there's tons of chance to take advantage of that probably once in mm. a five-year chance of getting 3,000 points off the FTSE. Mm -hmm. I, could carry yeah. on here. I could carry on here for about two hours. This is, I'm, I'm really, but anyway, it's up to you. I'm happy to carry on if you want a half an hour. I, um, unfortunately, do have a prior commitment, and I think it probably oh, is Megan, what call it. <laughs> Megan, Megan, we're, we're sorry, we don't want to uh, stop your social there. What, what, I, are you uh, what, are you what are you doing out of interest? Um, I is it well just uh, an evening. I I'm actually living. I'm living at my uh, parents' in law at the moment, oh, and yes. um, and we we've got company. I actually oh. I hope no nobody heard it, but there was a, a fire alarm going off about five minutes ago. So no? I might have to get out of the house for fire what? reasons. So um, <laughs> you don't want to burn yourself. Um, the stockopedia, do you? I can, I, mean, I can smell burning as well. So um, <laughs> I feel like I should probably go, okay. go and see what's going on right. there. Um, right. Both my husband and father-in-law are firefighters. So hopefully we're in Oh, well, yeah, they'll be all right then. They'll, they'll give you a fireman's <laughs> lift. Yeah. Well, sorry, firefighters' <laughs> yeah. lift. Sorry, not fireman, yeah. firefighter. Mm -hmm. Yes, get it right. Yeah. Uh, well, what can I say? I mean, um, oh, you've cut me off my prime. Anyway, uh, perhaps, how do we sum all this up? Um, I think be decisive, particularly in cutting your losses. If you've got a very good one, then try and run it. But be really disciplined with your trades. Have a plan and then execute. So don't have, don't have a stop loss and then oh, I'll just I'll push the stop loss down because I just, yeah, I'll give it a bit more room. Just execute your plan. And then you should hopefully find that your, your trades will go a lot better than just, I don't know, and, and use the screens. Don't. Just don't go on bulletin boards and get ideas from that. Find the screens and, and try and be unemotional with your trading. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you enjoy the book. I don't think it, yes. for some reason Amazon hasn't got it till July the 18th. I mean, there's loads of copies. Right? I think if you go to my website, if you go to nakedtrader.co.uk, I think Harriman House is doing an office. I think it's something like, I think the cover price is, was it 18? I think they're doing it for 15, including postage. But I think that's not for much longer. So perhaps you might want to take advantage of that. Uh, I'll see some of you Friday. I'm doing the live seminar on Friday, so see some of you uh, online. And I know there's a few of you that come to the retreat in September, so hopefully we'll have some good times there. And by the way, don't hesitate to email me. It's Robbie the Trader at AWL.com. I'm happy, I'm happy to help you out if you've got any questions on anything. Just don't worry. If it's a very long email, it might take me longer to answer. If it's a short email, I'll, I'll try and answer the same day if I can. So I'm, I'm happy to help. It's, yeah, that's great. Thank you. And we are getting a lot of uh, requests for um, for this to carry on, um, which is which is lovely. And I think, um, yeah, certainly something that we might might try and pick up again in the future. Another another Q and A with Robbie and, and other experts as well. Um, let's, let's do two hours. Let's do two hours next time because I think there's a lot of stuff we haven't really covered, which is a shame. But obviously, if your house is burning down, Megan, that is more important. Um, I uh, yes, and I also think seven o'clock is is probably the time that uh, for for most people to uh, to maybe uh, to 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 start enjoying their evening. Megan, evening. come on, you want to, Megan. Evening. This is all about EastEnders, isn't it? We're hooked on <laughs> EastEnders, and we're coming up to EastEnders time. That's the real reason. Come on, we don't buy all this fire in your house business. It's, we we know, we know <laughs> okay. about your EastEnders fixations. You've got well, to try to watching so soap. I'm telling you. Thank you very much, Robbie, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. It's uh, it's been as as uh, as you say, it's been so much to talk about. Great session. Um, thank you for your questions, and uh, yeah, have a have a look. Stay in touch, um, and we will let you know if there are any further um, sessions with Robbie coming up. Yes, I still saw in the chat three UKS. That's a really good. That's better than SUK two, by the way. The three UKS is the one I use because you get three times bang for your buck. Just saw that on the chat thing. Great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Uh, yeah. So see you all soon. I will. Um, I will close this. Uh, close the session down. Um, in a minute. No, um, I don't want to and... go. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. uh, yeah, we will. We'll try and get another session in. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Good luck, folks. Hope you do well. Be disciplined. <laughs> Bye. Bye.